This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, as members of the United Auto Workers head into their third day of a nationwide strike, General Motors has cut off health insurance for the nearly 50,000 people on picket lines across the country who are demanding better working conditions and fair pay. The news came Tuesday, just one day after UAW members kicked off the strike by walking out of more than 50 GM facilities. The workers say GM continues to deny employees' demands for better conditions and compensation, despite leading the company to record profits following bankruptcy and a federal bailout. GM responded by transferring the striking workers', workers health care costs to the union. UAW had sought to have GM cover striking uh, health insurance through through the end of the month. This is GM worker Steve Gorowski in Bowling Green, Kentucky. We got a company that had $35 billion in profits in the last few years. We've got temporaries that have been here over seven years and are still temporaries, and they're asking for more temporaries. They're moving our plants out of country. They're taking them to Mexico and to China. And now they're asking for concessions on our uh, health care. I don't know about you, but I, that's the only reason I took this job. I used to have my own drywall company. I took it for the benefits. Politico reported Tuesday that two top Trump administration officials were involved in ongoing labor negotiations and likely to side with the UAW. But GM and a White House spokesperson later denied the report. This is President Trump speaking about the striking workers Monday. Well, I have great relationship with the auto workers. I got tremendous numbers of votes from the auto workers. Uh, I don't want General Motors to be building plants outside of this country. As you know, they built many plants in China and Mexico, and I don't like that at all. Uh, my relationship has been very powerful with the auto workers, uh, not necessarily the top person or two, but the people that work uh, doing automobiles. Nobody's ever brought more uh, companies into the United States. It's the first company-wide strike against GM in 12 years. In 2007, GM workers walked out for two days. Well, for more, we're joined here in New York City by Stephen Greenhouse, veteran labor reporter formerly with The New York Times. His new book is just out. It's called Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past, Present and Future of American Labor. He's also the author of The Big Squeeze, Tough Times for the American Worker. His recent op-ed in The New York Times headlined, The Auto Worker Strike is Bigger Than GM. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Steve. Great um, to be here. It's great to have you with us. So, before we get into the history of the labor movement, which is really what your book is about, well, this is certainly one of the culminations of it, what we're seeing today. Um, talk about what's happening with UAW, what's happening with the workers, why they went out on strike against GM, and what this means. So, the UAW made big concessions back in 2008, 2009, 2010, when GM went bankrupt, and, and the union, understandably, wanted to help lift it out of bankruptcy to save jobs. So they agreed to uh, wage freezes and a two-tier wage structure. And GM has since become quite profitable. And GM is not offering a very generous contract, just a 4 percent raise over four years, according to the Detroit Free Press. And, and it's moved a lot of factories to Mexico and China. And the workers are saying, you know, what gives? We, the workers, we, the U.S. taxpayers, save GM. So why is it closing, you know, important plants in the U.S., like the Lordstown plant, while, you know, keeping plants running in Mexico that make the same thing? So they just—I think it's basically a sense of we— we helped you. We went the extra mile for you, GM, and now we want you to be fair to us. It's it's a it's really a strike over fairness and and being treated with the respect they feel that they deserve. And when you mentioned the, the concessions they made back uh, back in 2009-10 about this two-tier wage system, you actually explained last night in a forum that we were at that it's actually three tiers. Yes. You, what specifically does that mean? Uh, these tiers of wage systems. So back in 2009 during the bankruptcy. GM told the United Auto Workers, uh, we're definitely going to close these plants, and these other plants will agree to open, but only if we get a two-tier wage system. So the top tier paid $29 an hour. They set up a bottom tier that ran from, like, $17 up to about 25 And then they've now there's this third tier, you know, temps, and the temps make $15 an hour, and some of the temps have been there three and five years. So, uh, 
with all this concern about the increased precariousness of the economy and increased instability in jobs, you know, one of the focuses of the union of the strikers is we got to get rid of this, this, you know, this, these temp. I mean, we, we have to change these temp workers to make them permanent. It's unfair they're making just fifteen dollars an hour. They work side by side with people who make twice as much, and and there's side a feeling side by side often doing the same job. Yeah, right? doing yes, doing the same job, and and um, it's part of the UAW's saying, you know. We've been good to you, GM. We want you to be fair and good to us. Plus, the workers in the second tier uh, want the uh, gap closed with the top tier. They want to be moved up to twenty-nine, thirty-one dollars, very, very quickly. And this is Ted Crum, head of the UAW's bargaining committee, speaking at a news conference Sunday night. I want to be clear about something. This strike is about us. It is about standing up for fair wages for affordable quality health care, for our share of profits, and for our job security. We are standing with our brothers and sisters who are, on or who are temporary employees and in progression employees who do the same work we do for less pay. We are united. We are, we, we are strong. We are ready. We don't take this lightly. But General Motors needs to understand that we stood up for GM when they needed us. These are profitable times. We work hard to make this company profitable, and we deserve a fair contract because we have, we've helped make this company what it is. We are standing up for us. We make we make no mistake. The strike is about the members in Texas, Missouri, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and throughout the great nation. We are fighting for the future of the middle class, and we we want a fair and equitable contract. Thank you. So that's Ted Crum, head of the UAW's bargaining committee, speaking at a news conference as they were going out on strike. If you could respond to what he says, and also this latest move by GM not to pay the health care of workers. You retweeted today Sarah Nelson, the president of the Association of Flight Attendants, um, uh, CWA, tweeting about GM's decision to pull health care for all benefits. She said, a note to anyone who wants to use union members as a wedge to oppose Medicare for all. You UAW has one of the best plans in the country, but management can still use it to hold workers hostage. M4A puts power back in our hands, meaning Medicare for all. So I wrote this book explaining that, you know, unions did an amazing job, you know, lifting workers, you know, last century, creating the middle class, creating the 40-hour week, making mines and, and factories much safer. But over the past 20, 30 years, unions and worker power in the United States have gotten much, much weaker. I explain that's because, you know, corporations have really played super hardball to weaken unions. Globalization has weakened unions. And we've seen the Republicans, you know, Scott Walker most notably, trying extremely hard to weaken unions, especially public sector unions. So we're at a point where, where worker power in the United States is, I, I argue, the weakest it's been in many, many decades. So uh, there's a sense now that something is really broken. I mean, something is really broken. And, and you know, corporate profits have been at record levels and the stock market is at record levels, but we keep hearing that wages have been stagnant for year after year. They're going up a tiny bit now, but for the past few decades, they've been really stagnant for most workers. And people say, we have to fix this. And I think the reason we had the teacher strikes last year and the Marriott strike and the stop and shop strike and now the GM strike is they're saying, uh, we're not getting our fair share. And, and uh, as we just saw in the video clip, you know, GM had $8.1 billion in profits last year. Over the past three years, it's had $35 billion in profits just from North America alone. And the workers are saying, and, and, but you're closing these plants when we helped you keep them open. You're offering us just a 4 percent raise over four years, just 1 percent, that this is wrong. So this, I, I believe, is part of this healthy burst of strikes where workers are trying to win back their fair share and flex their muscles. Well, Steve, uh, in your book, you talk about, obviously, the corporate assault and the inability of unions to uh, organize uh, ba based on how the labor laws are being implemented by government. But you also talk about the self-inflicted wounds of the labor movement. And you talk about corruption that existed for many years in many labor unions. We're seeing that now with some of the investigations of the UAW, the sexism and racism of the union movement itself that didn't allow women workers and, and African-Americans to— uh, 
either to get into unions or then to be able to get into leadership. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, you also touch on this whole question of the failure of the labor movement to deal with the changing nature of work and technology. One of the most fascinating things in your book, you talk about companies like Task Rabbit and Mechanical Turk uh, and, and how pe workers are being forced to organize in those areas. Talk about most people don't even know what these things are. That's a, yeah, that's a lot, of, lot of ground to cover. So, you know, I make clear in the book that, on one hand, you know, some unions very much discriminated against women, uh, workers of color, African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanics. But I also make clear that, you know, going back over a century, women were an incredibly important part of the labor movement. You know, Mother, you know, Mother Jones, I write about this amazing strike in New York in 1909, 20,000 female garment workers, most of them immigrants. You know, a lot of workers take for granted the 40-hour week. And I explain these people, you know, fought, fought, went on strike for two months in the dead of winter just to win a 52-hour work week. And I, you know, I make clear that, you know, uh, I have a chapter in the Memphis sanitation workers' strike and, and, you know, and other unions backed them very strongly as they fought for both labor rights and respect on the job and, and civil rights. But as you say, Juan, you know, there has been too much discrimination, too much corruption. The UAW, unfortunately, has had a, a corruption scandal that is tarring it right now, and, and you know, that's hurting its image as, as it launches this big strike. You know, I often, when I was covering labor for The New York Times for 19 years, you know, people would often say to me, oh, unions are so corrupt. And I'd say, I don't know if unions are any more corrupt you know, pound for pound, person for person, than businesses. You know, look at Purdue Pharma and, and, and opiates. Look at the Trump administration and how corrupt that is. I don't think unions are any more corrupt. And I, and I look think at the that. Uh, and, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s, you know, the age of, you know, the bad days of the Teamsters and the Longshoremen and on the waterfront, there was horrendous corruption. And, it's, and, the, and the unions are much, much cleaner now. There's, you know, there's much less corruption, but there's still, you know, one bit of corruption is still too much. Before we move but, on but, to— What I wanted to ask you about this uh, uh, task rabbit and mechanical turkey, oh, right, right. we can talk yeah. about them. So, um, in the book, I explain, you know— 50 different ways that corporate America is trying to squeeze workers and weaken unions. It's using more temps. It's contracting out more. Now, the latest thing is using apps to turn, you know, more and more workers into, like, here today, gone tomorrow, here this minute, gone next minute workers, so they don't have to—they owe very little loyalty or responsibility to these workers. You know, it says, you know, and this is the big fight now with Uber and Lyft, it says, um, this, the companies are saying, you're not employees, you're just independent contractors. And if they're employees, then the workers can unionize. If they're employees, the companies have to pay part of the Social Security and, and Medicare tax, taxes. If they're employees, then they're covered by you know, anti-discrimination laws, anti-sexual harassment laws. So the companies really want to put millions and millions of workers into this independent contractor box. And they love this idea of, like, using apps so we can get a worker to work for 15 minutes and then dump him or her. It's just—it's, like, ideal. You know, there's no responsibility to the worker. They, they're here. They're gone. They're not covered by minimum wage or overtime laws. And, and one of the big challenges for the labor movement and for all worker advocates, as I explain in my book, is, like, figuring out a way to lift these workers to, you know, so that they could, you know, improve their wages. You know, there are all these Uber and Lyft drivers who work 60, 70 hours a week. They're busting their humps to try to support their families. They're not getting, uh, you know, health benefits from their jobs. And, you know, there's this uh, breakthrough in California. The state legislature passed a bill that would declare Uber and Lyft drivers employees rather than independent contractors. So that would give them overtime and minimum wage coverage. It would have the companies contribute to their uh, Social Security and, and Medicare. It would, you know, give them protections against race and sex discrimination. Now, the companies say, this is going to cost us too much. This is going to hurt our business model. We're, we're going to have to uh, hire fewer drivers. This is going to be worse for consumers. You might have to wait six minutes rather than four minutes for, for someone to pick you up. And you Any mentioned there's 500,000 people working for Uber right now? 
In, in the U.S., there, there's more than 500,000, and worldwide, there are over a million. And this fight is playing out in England and France and Germany, too. And you have uh, Whole Foods cutting the medical benefits of 1,900 workers. And we said in headlines, you know, Jeff Bezos owns Whole Foods, because Amazon owns Whole Foods. Um, He—Bezos uh, makes more money than the cost of the entire year of benefits for these nearly 2,000 employees in something like two to six hours, he makes. Sometimes you wonder, who does public relations for these people? Like, this is a real, you know, black eye for Bezos. You know, he's so rich, and he's really sticking it to these 2,000 workers, part-time workers, who I'm sure many of whom are having a hard time making ends meet. Our guest is Stephen Greenhouse, a former New York Times journalist. He is now author of the new book, Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past, Present and Future of American Labor. Um, among other things, we've been talking about the, this UAW strike, first major UAW strike in 12 years at GM. Um, interestingly, the Sunrise Movement, well known for pushing, pushing the Green New Deal, you know, sitting down at Nancy Pelosi's office right before she was named House Speaker again, um, Varshini Prakash, the executive director of the Sunrise Movement, threw her support um, behind the strike, tweeting, "All workers deserve a right to fair wages, guaranteed health care, job security, and basic dignity." Um, talk about the Green New Deal and what this means for jobs today and how um, companies like GM are adapting and how environmentalists are working with uh, unions now. I, I think the Green New Deal is a great idea. I do think we face a real global warming crisis. I think we as a nation, you know, our leadership is going in the very wrong direction. And when the Green New Deal was first announced, uh, it was leaked out prematurely before some details were worked out, a lot of union folks got angry and uneasy because they wor they worry that coal mines and coal-fired power plants and gas-fired power plants would be closing very quickly and throw many, many people uh, out of work. And I think the plan was released before they had finished working through, and the phrase now is, ensuring a just transition. And union leaders are, start are increasingly working with environmentalists to figure out what this just transition would be. You know, Bernie Sanders' uh, labor platform, Elizabeth Warren's um, Bernie's Green New Deal platform and Elizabeth Warren's both have very good ideas. Like, okay, there are, we're going to close some coal mines. You know, coal mines are going to close. Um, coal, coal powered fire plants are going to close, and and people are going to get laid off. So, you know, Bernie suggests paying them full wages for five years, providing them with training, providing them with full health benefits, providing you know, making sure their pensions are still paid into, and and. Ideas, proposals like that go very far to reassure uh, unions. And in others, I was in Germany um, uh, in the spring, and you know the Social Democratic Party there is really hurting. You know, and whereas the Green Party is doing very well, and people say the Social Democrats don't have enough ideas. And I think you know a lot of people on the left should really embrace the Green New Deal because it could mean you know trillions of dollars in spending on infrastructure. Many of them could be great middle-class union jobs. A lot of them require huge skills. There's this big push to build wind turbines that Governor Cuomo and, and environmentalists here and labor people in New York have really led the way on to create thousands of really good-paying jobs. Steve, uh, in your book, you have a chapter on uh, a revolution that most people don't pay much attention to, what's been happening in Nevada uh, in recent years and how Nevada has rapidly changed from a red state into a blue state, and largely as a result of the efforts of the Culinary Workers Union uh, in Nevada. Uh, could you talk about that, especially in the context of the past of the labor movement, that it was always anti-immigrant <laughs> for many, many decades, uh, until only recently and how that's affected the growth of labor in Nevada. Sure. So I, I have a section in the book about the unfortunate decline of unions and worker power and how, the, how that has led to wage stagnation, increased in inequality, and, you know, a horrible political system where the Koch brothers and billionaires and corporate donors dominate. And, you know, that's depressing and needs to be fixed. And then I have several chapters laying out various models about how to rebuild worker power. You know, the teacher strikes. Uh, did a lot to show that workers could fight again. The fight for 15 has, in many ways, been very successful. Then I also devote a chapter to, the, you know, to my mind, to what is, to my mind, what are the 
you know, best, most impressive, most forward-looking, most, you know, aggressive unions in the United States. That's the Culinary Union in Las Vegas. They represent dishwashers and hotel housekeepers. And, you know, they're 60, 70 percent immigrant workers. And while much of the labor movement has been shrinking in size, the Culinary Union has grown from 18,000 workers in the 1980s. It's more than tripled to 60,000 workers now. And it represents workers in, in the big hotel casinos. And, you know, Nationwide hotel housekeepers average $11 an hour. They often work just $25 a week, make less than $400 a week, make less than $20,000 a year. In Las Vegas, the hotel housekeepers earn, on average, $19.50 an hour. They're guaranteed 40-hour weeks. They make almost $800 a week, you know, $40,000. A year, I profile uh, a hotel housekeeper, wonderful woman, Frances Garcia, an immigrant from Honduras. She alone is able, on her salary at the from the culinary as a housekeeper, is able to raise three kids. She has a very nice apartment, you know, big screen TV. You know, her kids are going to college. I mean, it's it's it shows that where there's a strong, enlightened union that involves the people, that is willing to to engage in strikes, to, to make sure the employers pay their fair share, that, you know, these jobs that are often low-wage elsewhere can be really good middle-class jobs with uh, lots of respect. Now, on politics. So, remember, in 2016, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania all flipped from blue to red, those supposedly blue, you know, uh, blue wall states. Well, in Nevada, thanks largely to this amazing union, which really knows how to mobilize its members, uh, Nevada has flipped from red to blue. And, and, and in the 2018 election, Nevada was the only state where an incumbent Republican senator lost his seat. So, you know, this is a union that pardon my French, is really kicking ass. It's really doing a very impressive job. And, and I devote a chapter to it because they're doing so many things that other unions and other worker advocates should be doing. They're involving the members. They're mobilizing the members. They're willing to confront uh, the employer. They're organizing. They do amazing organizing, organizing several thousand workers a year. And in Nevada, uh, tr uh, Clinton beat Trump. Yeah, yeah. And—, and um, and so, and, and the crazy thing is, Nevada is a right to work state. So, you know, often unions are very reluctant to organize in right to work states because that means workers can't be required to pay union dues. Well, the culinary does such an amazing job uh, helping its workers that over 95 percent of the people pay union dues, which is much higher than at most, in most unions in right to work states. You've referenced the teacher strikes, and we, um, cannot say enough about the significance of these in the last year, and then also the upcoming Chicago teacher strike. If you can refer to what's happening here, this Chicago appears to be heading for a strike as the teachers' union in the country's third largest district continue to negotiate after rejecting the district's latest offer. Teachers have been pushing for better pay, smaller class sizes, among other demands. In addition to teachers, workers in SEIU Local 73 say thousands of special ed classrooms from assistants, bus aides, security officers, custodians could strike as early as October 17th if the newly elected Chicago mayor, Lori Lightfoot, continues in Rahm Emanuel's pro-austerity path, the last Chicago teacher strike seven years ago. So the Chicago Teachers Union has also been one of the leading lights in labor. And, and this, this strike in 2012 against Rahm Emanuel and, and his austerity policies was really a signal event in modern labor history. And it, and it kind of encouraged, years later, the strikes in West Virginia, Oklahoma, Arizona, that I write about in the book. And, and, you know, I have an op-ed in today's New York Times saying the teacher strikes and their success in ways embolden the GM workers. They, they feel that labor has wind on their back. They, at their backs, they saw that the teachers' strikes had huge public support because the public's concerned about wage stagnation, income inequality. So I think the GM workers are tapping into that sentiment. Now, in Chicago, still, you know, this very... Uh, Mil, you know, militant union, the Chicago Teachers Union, they're unhappy with continued austerity policies. I mean, I, you know, I, I wouldn't love to be mayor of Chicago right now, because it does, it's a city with a big budget squeeze, and, and they're saying to the union, you know, sorry, we can't spend as much as, as you like. And the union's saying, there are all these gazillionaires in, in, in Chicago. You could certainly tax them more to help improve the sco their schools. And it's another unhappy tug of war. Let's hope they reach a settlement. Uh, without a strike. 
Uh, I'm wondering if you comment in a few moments we have about the, the tensions that sometimes arise between the labor's direct interest for its members and the general societal issues. I'm talking about, for instance, uh, SEIU for many years cozied up to Republicans and conservatives who were governors or political leaders as long as they supported card check for their members. Uh, and so you have this tension that sometimes arises between the need to service your members versus the general social goals of the labor movement. So, so the SIU, so we're in New York. So the SIU uh, agreed not to oppose Republican Governor uh, George Pataki so long as Pataki agreed to spend an extra billion or $2 billion for Medicaid uh, and, and, and health care in, in New York. And that, that was good for the union members, but also very, very good for a lot, you know, a lot of New Yorkers who need health care. Now, some people say that was a selfish deal. The SAU says that was good for us and that was good for New Yorkers at large. One of the really interesting developments now in labor is I think a lot of unions realized, hey, we're being perceived too often as narrow self-interest, just fighting for ourselves. And there's really this fast-growing movement called bargaining for the common good. And again, that was led by the Chicago Teachers Union and then West Virginia, Oklahoma, Arizona teachers and Los Angeles teachers that we're not fighting. Yeah, yeah, we've had a wage freeze for two years or four years. And yes, we want to raise, but we're not just fighting for that. In West Virginia, Arizona, Oklahoma, they saw that the Republican government was cutting taxes to the rich, cut, cutting taxes on fracking, cutting taxes for corporations, while the education budgets were being starved, you know, and their pay freezes for teachers and not enough money for textbooks and, and, and class sizes were getting larger. And they said, you know, we're going on strike not just for us, but to help the community. And, and you know, the strike this fall by the hotel workers at Marriott, you know, they adopted a slogan that they knew, that they thought would resonate with the public, and it really did. It said, one job should be enough. I mean, it was crazy that all these workers were juggling two and three jobs. They were getting small raises while, you know, rents in San Francisco and Boston were soaring. So unions are really trying, you know, unions see that they're not as strong as they once were, and I explain this in detail. So they realize, we have to reach out to community partners and labor part and environmental partners and, and immigrant groups, and all together we could achieve a lot more than we can alone. Stephen Greenhouse, please stay after. We'll do part two and ask you about your assessment of the presidential candidates' records on labor. Stephen Greenhouse, longtime journalist, covered labor for The New York Times for decades. He has a new book out, Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past, Present and Future of American Labor. This is Democracy Now!, Democracy Now!, produced by Mike Burke, Dina Gesder, Nermeen Shea, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Libby Rainey, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Masu, Trina Nadura, Tay Maria Studio, and Maria Teresina. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.